It's a good job I've just about finished the repairs on the plane and made a runway, because I can get out of here. Not before time. The volcano's looking grumpy these days. Food check. Hmm. I'm running out of food. Just a few tins. But what if I can't take off or have to put down again? I'll need more food. Perhaps I should start growing those vegetables, just in case. But what's the best way and the fastest way to grow them? Should I put them in sunlight? Take them out of sunlight? Should I add water, reduce water? Should I try all these different types of soil? Now, I have to test all the options, but it's not like doing a physics experiment, because plants take a long time to grow, and sometimes they don't act like they should. Wouldn't you know it? Life or death situation, science line goes. And where did I put the phone? Oh. How can I help? Stella, we've been reading books about the countryside and how it's changing and how it needs to be conserved. Yeah, because wildlife numbers are dropping. But we were wondering, how do they measure these things? They can't go around and count every dormouse and every squirrel in the country. Yeah, because animals are always moving. So how do they know if they haven't counted the same one twice? How can you find out what makes a plant grow in one place? and not somewhere else. Yeah, would they have to test every plant? And how do they carry out tests on humans? Well, humans are animals, so it's just the same as testing on animals. OK. Well, say one person likes a new, improved chocolate bar. That doesn't mean to say anyone else will. Stella, what do you think? So many variables. I'll need to go and think about it. I'll get back to you. When you're dealing with living things, plants, animals, humans, and trying to test how different things affect them, how do you carry out tests that will give results that you can trust? Now, I want to know if keeping these beans in the sunshine will give better results than keeping them in the shade. How many do I test? One? All of them? And when will the results be of use? I think it's another one for Howie. It's watercress, and it's coming to a salad near you soon. But I'm not here to swap recipes. My investigation is to find out how the people who grow this stuff know that in exactly 25 days, you can go from this down here uh, to this supermarket-ready watercress. Surely they don't just guess. So, Steve, how much do you know about watercress? Well, a great deal. I've, I've conducted thousands of tests on the plant in the laboratory, out in the field, all aimed at working out how best to grow it. So, why do you need all this data? Well, watercress is a living plant. It's subject to a whole number of variables, and it's our job, really, to, to work out how to grow it best, predicting what variables are, are impacting on it and making whatever changes we can to, to minimise the effect they have. <laughs> Every day is different. The, the watercress is at a different stage of growth, and different beds, different times of the day. It's constantly changing, and, and if we don't react to those changes, we don't grow the consistent quality that we're looking for. OK. Got a video of 0.73, 0.74. Well, just over 0.7. How's that? Yeah, that's good. I mean, background water's about 0.5. We put fertiliser in it, brings it up to about 0.7. That's just what the crop's looking for. Just over 0.4. Yeah, that's, that's OK. I mean, it was coming in just over 0.7. 
it means the crop's taking fertiliser out of the water. I'd like to see it a bit lower than that, because it means some's, it's not taking up all that we're giving it. But it's a cold day today. I think we just need to keep our eye on this bed. So, we keep an eye on all the beds, and that's it, isn't it? Can well, we go? No, no, these beds might all look the same to you, but everyone's different. Different stage of growth, different flow of water. We need to check the top and bottom end of all of them now. Oh, OK. I've done it. Every bed checks top and bottom. Well There's done. enough there to keep you busy for at least a week. Well, I wish you was, Howie, but things changed quickly here. You know this bed we tested first of all? Yeah, it was about 0.4. Just try it again now. I don't, I don't believe it. It's over at 0.5. Well, it's not surprising. It's turned colder. The crop's taking up less fertiliser now. We've got a problem developing in this bed, and we'll have to make some changes. But. Does that mean I now have to test all these beds again? Well, if it wasn't for the fact we've done a lot of tests in the past, then yes, you would. As it is, we can take these results back into the laboratory, compare them with the tests we've done in the past, and we can adjust the flows based on that evidence. So all those lovely beds of watercress, they're all down to measurement, facts, figures, computers, testing. And of course the ultimate test of watercress quality is in the eating. Use the taste buds. You mean I finally get to eat some watercress? You do. Got a plate of watercress sandwiches lined up, ready for both of us. One small problem though, Howie. We've got 400 more beds to test, so let's get on with it. So, to get a result that I can trust, I need to test a lot of these seeds and see how they react to sunlight. But how do I know that sunshine will improve my vegetables? Well, she can let one lot grow for a week or two, then measure them. Then she can grow another lot in the shade for a couple of weeks and then measure them. Then all she needs to do is compare the results. It's easy. But what happens if it rains for two weeks on one lot of seeds and not the others? You can't compare those, can you? OK, just stick a couple of seeds in another container. It doesn't really matter what size it is. And then compare them. That can't be right either. What if the soil has some sort of effect? Or the pot's too small and the roots can't grow properly? Well, there must be a way of comparing things fairly and knowing how they've changed because of what you've done to them. Another one for Howie? <laughs> For this investigation, Stella has asked me to get 50 science in action stretchometers, check a physical fitness expert. Who are you? A physical fitness expert. Check and 100 children. Yeah! Wow, I think I've got myself an investigation. So, Gareth, what are you hoping to find out here? Well, what we're interested in, in investigating is the, the effect of warming up exercises on students' flexibility. And I guess that's where the amazing stretchometer comes in. That's where the stretchometer comes in. Can I have a go? Yeah. OK, put the box down. Let's uh, sit down, put your feet flat against the box, nice straight legs, right. hands on your knees to start with, thanks. Now put one hand on top of each other and reach forward as slowly as you can, as, as far as you can, along the scale, Great. OK, that's as far as you can go. Yeah. Fine. How do I do? Got a score of four. Is that good? Well, it's not so bad. What we're going to look at, though, is how can we improve that by warming you and these 100 students up. So why do you need so many of us? Well, each student is different. Some are taller, some are short, some are heavier than others. Some can reach further than others. And what we're looking for is to try and get a good average result for the whole group, not an individual result. So, by averaging everything out, you actually remove the other variables and you end up just by measuring the difference that exercise makes. That's right, and we get a better experiment and a better result because of that. Let's get on with it then. Okay. Okay, all sitting with straight legs. Those who are going to be stretching.
Right, here we go. Results from the first stretch. 17 centimetre average. Good, that's, that's about right. OK, what do we do now? Well, I think we should warm the students up. Fine, I'll just go and get them running around. No, we, we can't do that. We have to control for other variables. For example, they've already stretched. And, of course, we're in a nice warm gym, so that might have made a difference as well. That's right. What do we do? I think we should split the students into a control group who don't exercise and an experimental group who do exercise. And that way we can see whether it's exercise or just other things like being in a warm gym that improve flexibility. Yeah, that's right, we will. OK, I'm getting the hang of this. Excellent. Let's, Let's get go. on. OK, blues only. Stand up. Bring your pens and papers too if you can. Now, make sure you remember where it is. OK, now, I need you all over here. Stay with your partner. Walk faster. Thanks very much. That's lovely, that. That's a good position. Whew, that was hard work. But we've got the experiment finished. Yeah! Well, there's been an improvement in both groups. The control group increased their stretching by one centimetre. The experimental group, however, that's increased by three centimetres. That's a three-fold increase, three times increase in the experimental group compared to the control group. Well, it certainly shows that exercise really does help stretching. It does. Warming up is really important to protect yourself against injury and to prepare yourself to take part in sport later on. So, for sportsmen, warming up is essential? Absolutely essential. And, of course, because we've got a control, we know that these results are good. Absolutely. We've got some really good results and we've shown clearly that warming up is important to improve flexibility. Anyway, Howie, it's... Time you probably warmed yourself up, did a bit of stretching. So here's your broom, there's your mess, and I'll see you later. Thank you, appreciate it. Rats. These sports people are all the same. Lots of charging around, but it's always me who has to clear up. Oh, yes, it's always me who has to clear up. <laughs> If I water these the same every day, making sure the only difference between the two is that one is in the shade, then I should be able to have a fair comparison. And once I've done that, I can test the soils, making sure I've got a control soil for a comparison. It could take ages, but there really isn't any other way to do it. In fact, most experiments and tests with living things take a long time to do, sometimes years, because the scientists have to test the effects of every variable. But when they're done properly, they can tell us a lot about the world we live in. Now, that volcano is telling me something. I've got to get out of here. And while I'm packing, Howie's got one last investigation. Red squirrels are one of Britain's most famous endangered animals. And here in Cumbria, they take squirrel conservation very seriously. That's why I'm here, to investigate how they go about monitoring squirrel numbers. I mean... No. I mean, it can't be that easy. I've been sat under this tree for ages, and I've only seen two. Come to think of it, they look quite similar. They could have been the same squirrel. Oh! Hey, cut it out, you guys! I'm trying to help! <sighs> variables that affect the red squirrels in a reserve like this? Well, this is nature, so just about everything you can yeah. imagine. Um, the weather is a major factor, um, both in their day-to-day -day activity. Obviously, if it's wet and windy, they don't really want to come out. Um, but also in terms of the autumn seed crop, that's the most um, fundamental thing for red squirrels. If the seed crop in the autumn fails, then it means their survival over the winter is going to be very limited, and their breeding the following spring will also be much lower than normal. <laughs> It's very 
difficult and, and you have to um, count them as best you can. What we actually do is we walk on the set routes and count the number of squirrels that we see and from that we can calculate a population density estimate. So that gives us a number of about 300 squirrels for the site. 300 squirrels? How accurate is that figure? Well, it's, it's not totally accurate, but it gives us an estimate and, and what we really want to do is follow trends. We want to count how many squirrels there are from year to year, so we've got to make sure that we're not actually counting the variables, we need to cut those out as much as we can. So, um, you said weather was quite important. Well, what we do is we tend to choose two times in the year when we know that the squirrels are going to be really active. First is sort of late February, early March, just as the weather's starting to warm up. The squirrels are starting to breed, so they're really active and, and out and about. And again, in October, the weather's still nice and, and it's not really sort of become wintry yet, but the squirrels are really active, storing food up for the winter. So you need me to do my count exactly the same as it's been done in previous years? What you've got to think about is, is the route through the wood. Um, we have a set route and you need to walk that exactly the same way as the person last time, so right down to the speed that you're walking. Right, because if I went charging along the route, I wouldn't see half as many squirrels as if I ambled along slowly. That's right, so the way you need to do it is to walk each 100 metre section at a nice steady pace, taking about five minutes. How'd you get on? Right, I've done 1.2 kilometres and I've spotted five squirrels. Right, that sounds about right. How does that fit in with everything else? Well, we'll have to incorporate it with the rest of the data that's been collected, so it'll take a while to go through, but that looks pretty good. Excellent. One final thing, though. Mm -hmm. These squirrels, do you think they don't like me? What makes you think that. <laughs> Just a feeling I get. <laughs> Experiments. I'm getting out of here. 